I'm Molly Schwartzberg, and I'm the curator of British and American literature here at the Ransom Center. And we're all so pleased to have you here tonight. And it's a real honor for us to have Anne Waldman willing to come sit and talk with us and give us her thoughts on, on her writing, on the Beat Generation, and whatever else happens to be on her mind um, tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn off your cell phones before we get started. Um, or if you need to leave them on, put them on silent or something like that so that we don't um, so that it doesn't disturb the, uh, the discussion. Um, I'd also like to uh, say a couple things about upcoming events relating to the BEATS exhibition. Um, how many of you have been attending the BEAT film series? Oh, lots of people out there, great. The BEAT film series concludes next Wednesday. Um, the centerpiece of the series uh, on Wednesday will be Roger Corman's Bucket of Blood. So um, come prepared for some serious beat exploitation, um, We really encourage you to come. This is going to be the lightest evening. Everything else has been rather experimental. But Bucket of Blood should be, uh, should be really fun. And if you are interested in coming, please make sure to get your tickets early online. Um, every night of the, of the uh, series has sold out so far. So I'm very excited about that. Um, also, next Thursday, Douglas Brinkley, um, who has done some really important work editing the journals of Jack Kerouac and um, compiling the Library America edition of Kerouac's Road Novels, will be speaking about Jack Kerouac's America right here at 7 p.m., Thursday, April 24th. And that is our last lecture event for, um, in conjunction with the Beat um, exhibition. So I encourage you to come out. That should be a really, really um, exciting talk. Um, because, of course, he's deeply engaged with contemporary politics, and I'm at least hoping that he'll talk a little bit about Kerouac in relation to what's going on in the world um, today. Finally, before we get started, um, I'd like to extend really special thanks to Matt Valentine. Where are you sitting, Matt? There's Matt right there. Matt Valentine, who's the program coordinator of the Joins Reading Room, which is part of the Plan 2 Honors Program and also part of the, the uh, University Liberal Arts Honors Program. But program coordinator is really sort of a, a, a lame title. You need something like majestic um, coordinator of programs. Matt really does a lot to bring wonderful writers um, who are doing exciting work to campus. And he very kindly allowed us to hook on to his um, event last night, which was an Ann Waldman reading, so that we could bring her here to the Ransom Center and have her talk talk with you tonight. So thank you very much, Matt. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that these questions for Ann Waldman have for the most part been drawn from contributions left by visitors to the gallery. And also I've tossed in a few for, for myself that I want to ask. And also questions that, um, that, that uh, audience members at last night's reading contributed. So um, we have lots of wonderful um, questions that people left for Anne to answer. And she is completely unprepared. She has been given no advance warning. No, it's going to be first thought, best thought. First thought, best thought in, in, in true Kerouac style. And um, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to try really hard not to throw her any really difficult ones. Well, first thought, best thought is, um, is famously um, a statement attributed frequently to Jack Kerouac as a statement of his, of his poetics. And I guess um, this might be a very specific way to start our conversation, but maybe we could start with Kerouac and mm -hmm. talk a little bit about, um, you, you mentioned yesterday when we were chatting, um, how important the, the, um, the avant-garde elements of Kerouac's work are. And I'm wondering whether you think Kerouac's style and his form and his mm -hmm. innovations have been recognized as much as they should be. Well, I think they're starting to be recognized. There's some really good scholarly work, uh, I think, through the publication of the letters and other materials that place him in more in the context of the uh, avant-garde scene. So that, you know, to think that he was just writing in some isolated, you know, little island somewhere and not aware of the, for example, the work of someone like um, someone like John Cage or uh, various art movements. Um, the you know that his he, he was looking at painting. He was aware of the thinking of Charles Olson. You know his his projective verse manifesto. Um, and so, the, you know, I think he's been presented as such a cultural icon. I mean, not within people who are reading this material and know the period and know the historicity and the dates and the frames and the intersections that were 
uh, invariably happening. But you know, just to see in his his um, uh, some of the techniques, the the you know, you talk about first thought, best thought. That's actually also a Buddhist idea that comes from the notion of uh, not uh, censoring yourself often before we even you know make the first uh, move. We're you know, the, something is clicking in, oh, I can't say that, or there's some amount of, I think this is really rustling. Is it? It's microphone? Are we okay? I just tend to move a lot. So I have to contain myself. Go into samadhi. Um, so that, that is happening. I was recommending a book called Action Writing by an a English uh, critic and uh, art historian. And he, play, you know, he talks about the, the actual you know, similarity to, say, the work of, of Pollock. Um, I think to, inv to look at some of the other figures in the beat literary movement, you know, certainly William Burroughs is, comes to mind immediately in terms of his cut-up techniques and the connection to avant-garde film and, and so on. So this work is being done. I think there's, there's um, more, more work is being made accessible and shows such as yours, I think, encourage um, a, a closer examination, closer readings. And um, you will be seen in, in a more layered way. And I think, um, you know, personally, we, uh, there, there seems such a connection to Kerouac in the, my generation of, of poets, actually. Uh, writers like Clark Coolidge were very obsessed with uh, Kerouac's method. If you look at Coolidge's own poetry, which seems to be closer to some of the language poetry experiments, it doesn't, you know, where is Kerouac in there? But there's such pure, you know, attention to the sound in the words. What he's, what, what's missing is, is the more semantic links and the, uh, you know, kind of narrative links in Coolidge. Not always, but, but the, you know, the influence of um, Kerouac's, you know, it's, it's kind of scatting. And yet, as we look at the manuscripts, it's not so much of first thought, best thought. Anymore. It's not uh, just spontaneous, uh, you know, high on benzedrine prose, you know, going all night on. Well, and too, it seems as though just spontaneous is is such a really common misconception yeah, that actually, very, uh, my understanding is that in order to compose the scroll, um, or or he he put together the scroll in order to force himself into a sort of spontaneous state. Right. That for him, there it it took um, it took a great deal of. Um, of work to be spontaneous. Well, yeah, there were already versions of On the Road. There were a lot of false starts. There were many different, uh, you know, texts that had, he had not entirely abandoned. I think some are, some things are missing, mm -hmm. but it, you know, to to arrive at that final place with the scroll was a lot of a lot of uh, thought and and uh, putting himself in a kind of extreme situation. And that, you know, I think that the drugs uh, that sort of legend is completely, you know, when you think about what he accomplished. I don't think it would, he would have been able to sustain it. Yeah, I mean, I think that Aunt, when Ann Charters was here um, talking about, about Kerouac and Cassidy and, and John Cullen Holmes a couple of weeks ago, she said that Cassidy could never have been a writer because he was doing right. so, mu so, so many much, drugs. Yeah. And Kerouac, in, in, in opposition to that, really, really wasn't. And exactly. they're, they're yeah. such different figures, and they still get, they still get merged so, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. frequently. Well, uh, pr probably the most... Um, the most outward statement you've made about the importance of Jack Kerouac to poetics is the naming of the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics right. um, at Naropa. And um, just so our audience knows, um, in 1974, you were invited to read with Ginsburg and Diane de Prima at a workshop at the Naropa Institute, which had been founded j just that year by uh, the Tibetan Buddhist teacher Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And at the event, you sort of decided to found this to found this school. Is that the correct Well, we were way invited to... out to give workshops and readings. I think it was a two to three week period. Uh, Diane de Prima was also present. The poet uh, Jackson McClough had come through town. Uh, John Cage as well had given a reading the night that uh, Nixon resigned, which was quite an event <laughs> since people wanted to just party. And John, John Cage had a very different idea about the um, the event. He was working with his Moreau text, reading, readings through Thoreau, and um, 
It was actually a very cool performance. He had his back to the audience, and he was showing images of, of um, Thoreau's calligraphy from the journals of, on, on a screen. And meanwhile, people were out in the audience, you know, playing instruments, and we have these, you know, cushions for meditation, throwing the cushions around and chanting and singing. And here was Cage with his back to the wall, going through this very uh, interesting piece um, with just con you know con sounds of consonants, and then long gaps of you know ten minutes of silence. It was incredible. And then it, at the end, he turned around and said, "I thought this was a Buddhist school." <laughs> <laughs> I think I said, "But but Richard Nixon." <laughs> Richard, Richard, Richard Nixon trumps Buddhism. Right, yes, I guess so. I guess that's the <laughs> message. But in any case, so we were, uh, you know, having workshops, having readings, performances. Also, I mean, we were very interested in Trungpa's teachings and these lectures that would happen every other night. And there were other guests there and various uh, figures coming through. And it was a, you know, a, I think Ram Das came through with a whole troupe of love and lighties. That was fun. And... We had a, a sort of, um, it was kind of like a bazaar, you know, things, people were selling candles and incense and massage out in the parking lot. And um, in any case, we did have a meeting at, towards the end of this summer session. And the idea was to, you know, discuss how, it, how effective it had been. Did we want to continue to be involved? Did we want to start something that would continue in some way? And it was a you know, sort of historic meeting because Choigam Trungpa said, and I, I'd come out from New York with Alan. Uh, Diane had been, was living in San Francisco, and other people were come, you know, traveling coast to coast. And at this meeting, Choigam Trungpa said, we're talking about founding a, a school you know, with a backdrop of, of Buddhism or meditation, with a non-competitive view of education. And it's a 100-year project at least here we had been there for a very, you know, very rich and full two or three weeks, and uh, some people were lingering, but it was in, intense, and I had been working for a number of years at this poetry project at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery in New York, which was um, already in its, that had begun in 66. So, but somehow both, Alan, we both felt this shock to pot, you know, this idea of a, a, a project that would go beyond our own lifetimes was very, much the hook, you know, one was involved with, you know, very, um, not fly by night, I mean, certainly the poetry project, which still continues, right. goes on and on, I think will be a hundred year project at least as well. I'm just amazed to hear that he said that, and um, really you're a quarter of the way there already with Naropa, mm -hmm. I, right? I mean, yeah. Pat, beyond a yeah. quarter of the no, way exactly. there. No, and the, several of the questions that people left in our, in our notebook had to do with, with, with the institute or the university, or mm -hmm. I guess the university now. And one of the questions was from um, from a high school teacher, Matt Dearman, and he said, um, "How do you feel about the school today? What was your original vision, and mm -hmm. and does that vision continue, and can it continue?" Right. Well, back to the naming. When we decided on the Kerouac name, uh, this again, as I was saying, he was such an influence on poets and writers of my generation. And Alan and I both saw that he had experienced the first Buddhist noble truth, which is the truth of suffering. So that was a very important point. And then I th it was going to be the Jack Kerouac School, and there were issues. You know, I've been joking about Gertrude Stein School. I thought that would really be outrageous in, <laughs> in Boulder, Colorado in you know, 1974. And um, actually, the poet Kathleen Frazier came, and having heard that story, she made t-shirts that said the Gertrude Stein School. <laughs> So we'll get around to it. I tried to start a Gertrude Stein Center in, in Denver, but they, they're not quite ready for it. Still, we'll not see. today. It could, it could happen. In any <laughs> case, the, um, I think the, there was a period maybe 10 years into the school's history where uh, suddenly some of the administrators thought, well, what, why does your program get to have its own name, the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics? And I threw in the disembodied. We had no building, we had no money, we had no telephone, we had no stationery, and we had a sense of this you know, rich lineage of, of poetry and poetics. Uh, people, many people had passed on, but we would invite our faculty to teach you know, something they were passionate about. So one could teach, as Alan did, Blake or 
Dante. We had a rotating Shakespeare course at one point where William Burroughs did uh, some talks on Troilus and Cressida. You know, it's a great idea for a, you know, a, a Kerouac school a Shakespeare course with picking your, Alan taught the Tempest. Ginsburg talk, taught the Tempest. But in any case, we suddenly were asked to just become the writing department, you know, give up our name. And Trunkba was still alive, and I went to him and I said, this is outrageous, you know, we, we already have, it has cachet, the Kerouac school name, and this disembodied, just people can't get, you know, what is that? It becomes this kind of koan. So he said, yes, I agree, you know, don't change the name of a boat in midstream. He knew had enough, I mean, maybe that's also an old Tibetan uh, slogan or something, but any case, but there was a little bit of a fight and an issue around the name, you know, keeping the name. And I could see that things were changing as we were becoming more institutionalized and more and accredited. And the accreditation process happened in, I think, around 85, where we had to meet. We, I remember we were working for very little pay, and sometimes we were forfeiting, you know, our paychecks just to, you know, survive. And uh, we were being asked to work, o really, overtime on weekends. We would have these kind of retreats to talk about and, and get together the accreditation piece because it's, you know, a phenomenal amount of work. I don't know, maybe some people here have been through that. What was the, what was the reason for the decision to, to do the accreditation process rather than stay? I think it was the only way we could survive necessary. because people needed to get something. A certificate just wasn't uh, value, you know, of, of a certain kind of value and did not translate to other schools, for one thing. And uh, that was important to me, especially when we decided that the summer writing program could have its own life. It would be part of the degree programs, but also open to any students from other schools that could come during the summer. And get credit. And get basically. credit, yeah. both VA and, and MFA. And it was, you know, I still, something in me was resisting that mode. And, and I remember around that time, I think Andre Kudrescu came and did an, uh, an NPR piece on the school and said, you know, the difference between this and other writing programs is that it's modeled on the old sort of Dada, surrealist view, more like Cafe Voltaire, and you have, you know, you're meeting people in this public way in a, in a different kind of environment. You know, it's less the class, you know, traditional classroom environment. And so, you know, and everybody felt that, that that was the di difference, and it wasn't as competitive, and it wasn't, you know, tenure track situation amongst the faculty and so on. And it ha you know, it has its pros and cons um, in terms of the struggle. I mean, the, the salaries are still very low and people go the extra mile and I think it, that's, that's why it works actually. And the students are very, very involved and in many ways they carry on and, and continue to work there. And, and um, I mean, a lot of the people in the summer writing program are former students and people on the faculty. So we don't have that strict rule where you, you know, often when you go to a school and, grad and get a degree, you, do you don't teach at that school. There's right. a policy. Right. And that's also understandable. But for me, it was a sense of lineage and continuity and people had to, um, you know, change, shift the frequency, you know, shift the paradigm of school. So there, you know, there's so many things that are so similar to what it was back then in terms of energy, community, the kinds of engagement people have with the, uh, the, their own work, primarily, and the way they study things. We have a phenomenal archive, so students are encouraged to work with the school's archive. And yet, you know, they hired a, <laughs> a new um, dean, and we, we really had trouble in the beginning. I mean, he, was, he came in questioning the name, the Jack Harawak School, and I said, how long do I have? You know, is it going to be 100 years before I can, you know, say that this is, this is the name. Let's settle it yeah. once and for all. I, it, it's interesting because um, there, there have been several ch changes to a lot of sort of alternative, you know, commonly known alternative schools like UC Santa Cruz um, mm -hmm. began, has changed their policy. They used to have no grades. I know. know. Now I know. they have grades, which is, I think, really sad. And I think a lot of people who, who went to that school and even students, current students and My current faculty went, at the school, there. yeah, feel really sad about that. And the the closing of Antioch College, and all sorts of changes to these wonderful educational experiments from the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, where do you think um, this space is for alternative education today? Do you think that there is still room for that? I mean, it sounds like you think there is at Naropa. I think there is at Naropa, and I think there, can, you know, there are enough people there who've been, you know, were part of the, or, or refer back to the founding principles and so on. 
I do think that, I, I mean, I encourage students to start their own pro programs, you know, their own schools, that it actually can be done. And have they? And, well, little projects here and there. There's some, some graduates here in the audience who might know a little bit about that. But we've had students who, one woman went to the Seattle area and started a program for kind of after school program for high school kids and, and did you know, a lot of slam and that sort of thing to bring them in and then was able to do festivals and then got other organizations in the area to uh, be more involved. I think she moved on to some other kind of work, but working within the arts community, organizing, um, there have been, we have a project outreach uh, run by poet Jack Holland where students go and work in prisons and work in schools and work with um, hospice situations and work with the elderly. And those have led to, you know, projects within those communities. So the view that, you, you know, there's not one way to be a poet in the world. It's not just about a, you know, a certain kind of academic career. Although I've said this before, I'm very grateful for the fact that the, you know, the avant-garde is can be within the academy and, and get support. And without that, I think, support, a lot of things would not be happening. I mean, I wouldn't be here, most likely. And, you know, there's a kind of momentum. And um, But when I go to something like the AWP, as a recent, the Associated Writing Programs gatherings, it's, you know, it's very, very intense. Um, and there's, you know, a kind of hungry ghost quality, but then the small press stuff is so great. And a lot of our students and people you know, involved with and affiliated with Naropa have done you know, wonderful work in this small press realm. And that, I think, keeps, as they say on, is it CNN? Keeping them honest, yeah. you know, the small press world. It's such a great ethos. And so much of this whole uh, alternative, I call it the outrider scene in uh, the new American poetry, which is you know, international at this point, is, was based on a kind of gift economy. You know, it was a kind of exchange. It wasn't about the, the you know, the, the actual money. It was, you know, exchanging um, your publications, your work. You know, I mean, I, at times I would give, just give somebody a manuscript in exchange for something. Yeah, that so. was one of the wonderful things working on the exhibition was learning about all the little magazines in the 50s and 60s and mm -hmm. with circulations of 200 right. for free, passed out on the street or simply sent through into the mail. And I wonder if the internet is, is providing that outlet now today. Well, it is, but there's still these small presses the are going. I mean, presses. you have a great one here in Austin, the Skanky Possum. That's right, editors Skanky Possum. Can, now, speaking of Skanky Possum and other, and other projects like that, um, where do you think the, I mean, one of the questions somebody asked was, who do you think today uh, is sort of carrying on the tradition? And I guess it depends on how you're going to define the tradition of the beats, but where do you see that the energy necessary for carrying on the tradition and what do you think is that energy? What do you think, where do you see that happening or do you see it happening? Do you, right. are you, do you well, have a positive outlet look for, for, um, for, for the future of poetry, I guess, as, a, as, an, as an active, mm -hmm. um, what did somebody say? One of the questions was, um, does poetry still have a place as public art today? Oh, yes, um, yes. And, yeah. and if you could talk a little bit about younger poets that you think are really... Well, if you look at your show, I mean, there's so many communities represented in there, and you have, you know, this beautiful drawing of Robert Creeley, you have, you know, Charles Henry Ford collection here, which, draw, you know, overlaps and dovetails the Paul Bowles, uh, being, you know, part of that, I, you know, I call it the, it's kind of a, ry a rhizome, a rhizome, and one of my favorite terms, which comes from Cliff Clifford Geertz, the uh, anthropologist, is consociational. So you have these consociates who are over, you know, intersecting at certain points. They're not the prime movers, say, of the beat, uh, you know, literary movement as such. And, it, you know, without Allen Ginsberg, who knows if that would have become, you know, a kind of ph phenomenon, the way he, he really promoted this uh, idea. And, you know, with Kerouac supporting Gregory to a certain extent. But the consociational quality, which you see in your show with Robert Duncan and Jess and the uh, Duncan who is in correspondence with Allen and Olson, you have Black Mountain and you have all these, uh, you know, sort of, schools of the so-called New American Poetry that were brought together in the famous Don Allen Grove book. And they were very much in touch. And it was you know, wonderful to see something like the Robert Duncan Denise Levertov letters where 
people are actually sending tapes as well. It's not just manuscripts. And you know, we're talking about early, you know, some decades back, sending a tape of a reading, one copy, which then you know circulates around, and so actually hearing each other's uh, voices and soundings. So that I see going on in certainly the Naropa community and, and what t people take out from there. Uh, there have been little pockets of, of, um, of communities that have, have been inspired by that model to some extent. There was a, a, a program that still goes on more online now, but uh, in Vienna, the Schule für Dichtung, where I went and helped them work on their program, which had workshops taught in uh, German, Spanish, and English. The, uh, a, a, there were a group of students who went to Prague and were the precursors of our own study abroad program in Prague that Naropa, it, we're in and out of that. Sometimes um, we just can't you know, afford to take just 10 students, but um, that's still ongoing. And the Poetry Project definitely is you know, a healthy site. The Bowery Poetry Club in New York is incredibly diverse and very active. Um, you can go and hear Croatian poetry, or uh, the gr wonderful griot poet Papa Suso, who teaches classes in, that, in the griot tradition. So Bob Holman, who oversees that, has brought in a lot of different um, realities and cultures, and you know it's a wonderful hybrid situation occurring in New York. And out of that, we developed something called the Study Abroad on the Bowery, which has morphed into some other things, but for a couple of years. Um, it actually was conceived at, at Naropa. Somebody said, well, I was saying after 9-11 the, after and the war on terror, we couldn't run our programs in Indonesia, which I had had a, a role in. We couldn't run our program in Nepal because of the political situation there. We had been designing a program in India, but because of the Pakistani Indian thing at the time, you know, at the time things have gotten better there, but there were troops all along the borders. And where could we go? And, and somebody said, well, let's <laughs> we'll go to the Bowery. We'll do study abroad <laughs> in the Bowery. You know, we don't have to go anywhere <laughs> you know, out of this, you know, off the, the continent. So that program was a, a certificate program. We looked into getting it, um, actually getting it uh, accredited, and that would be a long process. We wanted to hook up maybe with CUNY or with Columbia College and Columbia came was very very interested and they said but they said they wanted an exclusive huh. at that point I you know I was ready to just go to the streets you know let's just teach in the streets you know we, we want it to be available to you know students from other programs and other uh, schools in the, especially in the New York area so these things are all in you know they're in different stages there are ideas out there um, I do think you know people are just some of our, our poets have become our writers Graduates from Naropa have become printers, so they're doing small, you know, actual letterpress printing, and they're all over. Well, and it sounds too like um, you've talked so much about international programs, and of course the exhibition is all about travel. Oh, I love that aspect. Of the and oh, I'm so exhibition. glad, and the the importance of of recognizing sort of the the desire to go out, mm -hmm. and I think that. Um, that that desire to go discover new things translates into the into the later political nature of the poetry of someone like Allen Ginsberg, this willingness to take risks, this interest in understanding um, the other perspective, um, all of this. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about about that political drive today in poetry. And that's sort of a vague way to state the question, but well, there's a lot of translation going on. I think many poets are taking that, to, you know, the importance and I've even met students here who are in Arabic studies and um, a woman from Israel who's looking at Israeli writers and I think that's a really important um, aspect if you, if you have that knack for language and curiosity or something in your own background and Willingness to travel and look for them. I mean, you can find uh, these writers anywhere. The um, I think Alan was, you know, he was so good at going to places and seeking out the culture. And, and certainly, this happened in India and particularly in Calcutta. He became very close to this movement of poets there, who were, of course, more secular and uh, actually more like, you know, communist Marxists. And here's Alan's coming along with his obsession about finding a guru and you know asking why aren't you writing poems about Krishna and you know all your your Hindu gods and deities and so there's this interesting clash of realities and yet he also had that you know his own background in a you know very secular background as well so those funny contradictions come up and 
but that there's there's a whole movement that in fact there are um, a lot of new scholarly work on there's a book that's come out the beats in India a lot of work on um, looking at the you know how that affected the poets there and what they were doing and Sunil Ganguly is a very well-known writer um, I mean some of the Indian poets were more in the Tagore tradition but encountering Alan and encountering the poem how changed their perspective uh, certainly Alan going to spending time in London influenced you know poets there um, in, in terms of you know performative modes uh, I can't speak so much. To, I don't think there was so much contact with writers in Mexico or South America, but that's huge now. And City Lights has been exemplary in publishing work from South America and other places, in, but Mexico and South America, a lot of fiction has you know, a real uh, commitment to that. So I think in terms of you know, when you ask where things are going, there is a, there is a, a conversation and a consociational web out there with, you know, with, with translation and with certainly on the internet. I mean, I've, you know, in the last year I've been to India to work with um, Marathi poets. This is this ancient, you know, tradition of oral poetry and kind of an underclass tradition. And some of those poets also had met Alan and I had met someone in an earlier trip to India, but they had a whole festival of Marathi poetry from very traditional uh, work to more beat-like poetry to, uh, you know, more women, I noticed, in that community reading. And then to China, which is, again, is another, an, an, a whole conference on uh, 20th century American poetry and people doing very interesting work with the objectivists. You know, and you think of a, a writer like uh, Louis Zukofsky or um, Charles Reznikoff or, I mean, it's mind-blowing. It's just wonderful. You mentioned you mentioned more women poets, and one of the things we haven't even talked about oh, yet yes. and is, is is the issue of gender. And, and it was and this is a kind of a funny one because I, I got question after question after question about being a woman poet, and um, and I guess that would be the the first thing I would ask you is, do you um, how does it feel <laughs> to be sort of the figure who stands as the beat woman poet, as a spokesman, you know, a spokeswoman for for the female beat experience? Is that is that a position that you well, feel like no, you had no, to I, inhabit, or I is feel, that a good thing? Well, I also feel that I'm somewhat of a hybrid, having been, you know, I, I'm a, a younger generation. People ask me, you know, about the 50s and the beat scene, and I missed some of those parties a lot. <laughs> Um, well, although you grew up in that I grew scene. up in McDougal Street. Yes, there were parties in my own fam my family. My parents had parties, and I s encountered, you know, the Gregory when I was quite young, and certainly reading this work. And my father had met Alan in the 50s, and, and Alan had visited Pace University where he taught. And I had, you know, I had these, this bohemian upbringing. My, parent, my mother had lived abroad a number of years. She had got, left America in 1929, and lived in Greece, weaving her own clothing and her own sandals and been part of a kind of alternative community there. So, um, but in any case, I, I think I, I certainly have to credit my mother with a, a certain uh, strength of, of vision of being, you know, and being an artist and sort of holding that ethos um, and encur being encouraging, you know, these early uh, attempts at poetry I remember in, in high school sending poems to the Evergreen Review and having them, you know, rejected. And um, I remember, you know, things like there'd be some cereal box, some contest to enter, and you know, what is, what is your image of yourself, some your 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 uh, self portrait? And I would send a, a, a kind of a French, you know, a beret, little girl with a beret on toe shoes and things like this. So I mean, it just to, it, it's funny to me now, just to you know, there were these early leanings and yearnings and um, certainly you know Ferlinghetti was in some presented I think in my high school the Christ climb down book had come out and Hal was already in, you know in the in the air my father knew the poem certainly so um, but at the same time as when I went off to to Bennington it was primarily male you know this kind of male uh, pedagogy was being presented, and the canon was much more dominated by male writers. And in fact, at Bennington, they weren't even teaching. I mean, that was one of my questions. Why isn't Ginsburg taught here? Why isn't Ezra Pound taught here? Where is Gertrude Stein? I mean, so 
So there were a, a lot of issues of that nature. I think I, I always, again, back to my, you know, being in a different, slightly younger generation, I, Alan was maybe 18 years older, something like that, and some of the other figures. So I always think it's about 20, you know, one generation. Um, I felt also, I mean, I'm, I'm, my labels include New York School with a, you know, connection to Black Mountain through my, you know, interest in Charles Olson. Um, certainly the, the poet Ed Dorn has been a, you know, figure in my life and, you know, I love his work um, and others. And the New York School, which is really, when we started the Poetry Project, it was really, you know, the, the core was kind of a New York School. And um, I had met Frank O'Hara and, you know, fairly young, before I even got out of school, got out of college. I was in a workshop with Bill Berkson at the New School, I think the one uh, summer of, so there, there was a lot of hybrid, I, you know, I have to call it hybrid, and I think a lot of the poets of my generation and things and, and generations since have still building on a lot of these branches of the, uh, this tree, this interesting tree, but also we're, we were, I mean, one, one is reading a lot of things. I mean, one is reading epic poetry, one is reading, you know, Dante's, um, uh, no, Vita Nuova, which would seem to be, you know, have some resonance with experimental writers of my generation, and you know, many other things. So many. I mean, as we all are, we're all reading a lot of things simultaneously. But I think the beat, because of my, uh, I think the thrust toward political activism, the Buddhism, the uh, performance. You know, these were all, and I felt more akin in my uh, psyche, I guess, to those. Uh, those kinds of directions for my own work and my own path, you know, a spiritual path and, and also experimenting with, you know, hallucinogenics and wh where that fit into a kind of, um, you know, uh, thinking about the world and, and, and leading to certain spiritual uh, practices and then interested in the more fellaheen worlds. So of course, you know, you're raised in a, a you know, it's kind of, at least in school, you know, you're looking constantly back to Europe, constantly to you know, British poetry and those, uh, the forms, of, which are wonderful. And I mean, I went through a whole romantic period, obsession there. But then it's, I, I really felt very profoundly this urge to look in, you know, to East, to look towards the East and also the tantric traditions, shamanic traditions. Uh, what, uh, what was so exciting about working in Indonesia was the, you know, the theater and dance of Balinese, you know, Hindu, Bali and the gamelan music and you know it's a it's a way it's a kind of cosmology that you discover in these art forms are also taught orally you're not reading you know books and texts you listen to the teacher play you repeat that you listen to the singing you repeat that in the sick in the early 70s I think 71 I took a class with Pandit Pranath who was a wonderful Indian singer and the the uh, teacher of, of Lamont Young who was a very interesting composer and so on. So, you know, there were already these yearnings toward, uh, you know, other kinds of forms and ways that my own work, I mean, I didn't think of it that way. You know, I'm going to, um, I was just following this natural propensity. And so, you know, early trips to South America and India, and, and I mean, I also traveled to Europe, but I, there, was a, there was more of a quest, I think, in going in this other direction. And so a lot of, I felt that, you know, that Alan had, had um, I mean, I wasn't looking for the, the, the guru in a way. I mean, and I think by the time I met Alan, he'd calmed down a little. I mean, he, he decided not to be the head, the spiritual leader of the Hare Krishnas. <laughs> the job had been offered to him. And <laughs> that would have taken, uh, you know, American poetry in an interesting direction. Um, and, and his and the political work. So I, you know, we would sometimes travel together. I wasn't at the actual '68 um, convention, but then went to the the trials and you know saw Bobby Seale gagged, and uh, we did a lot of demonstrations out in the park there. And uh, have you seen the chanting. Have you seen the new film? I haven't yet? seen that yet. I want to see that. Yeah, yeah. that's high on Very high on my list. Great. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, sorry to natter on. No, oh my God. But I just, it, it's, it's Do we so want her to keep more, nattering on? What I love about your show is that it show, you know, it indicates the complexity. And, you know, any one of those texts or, or exchanges can be like this seed syllable into a whole, 
you know, a whole, um, uh, and I think this is something for students to do, and I tell the students in Europa, look at the archive, there's great seeds in here for work that you want to do, scholarly work. Um, my friend Amiel Alcalade, who's in CUNY in New York, he gets his students on these projects. I mean, one young woman um, is, is editing the, the Ameri Baraka Ed Dorn correspondence, which is a huge correspondence. And um, I think there's a lot of, of these, this kind of work that can be um, done. And so you, the map is vast, and the intersections are so interesting. And I mean, just uh, thinking about the, you know, how Buddhism is, came into the, the, the culture and how it has influenced. And we talked about this because uh, I'm critiquing a manuscript now about, for Wesleyan about the influence of Buddhism on the avant-garde. So you get, you know, there's so many of the beat writers, but also the um, John Cage, uh, various visual artists. Uh, when T. T. Suzuki came and was lecturing at Columbia, a lot of people went to those classes, including Jackson McClough and others. So it's not as if one person does discovered Buddhism and then, you know, it was Alan who may, or Kerouac made everybody a Buddhist. I mean, it's you know, it's very subtle and yeah, and I think that. Um I think that it's, it's amazing going back and looking at these documents and watching, as I was working on the exhibition, sort of watching Buddhism start sort of right, being right. present in more and more places. Right. And it really just blossomed. And then also Hinduism as well is a hugely important um, part of sort of the, the counterculture in the 60s, obviously. Absolutely. And I think that, that the younger generation is just starting to figure that out. I was touring a group of students, I think I told you, through mm -hmm. the exhibition, and they got really interested in the India material, and that oh, case was just so exciting to them to start thinking about things like the Hare Krishna movement mm -hmm. and these chants and the sort of Ginsburg actually being hugely important in publicly chanting. Oh, I know. And um, people, was, who were, outrageous. people who were at the film, film series on Wednesday saw the film Holy Communion, which is the film of the the amazing international poetry incarnation at the Royal Albert Hall in 1965. And it begins with Ginsburg chanting in front of 7,000 people in the Royal Albert Hall. And I just, when you put that in context and imagine, you know, I would love to know what that audience was thinking mm -hmm. at that time. And, and, you know, I think that Buddhism today, I just, you know, in, in American culture, I just sort of do the, you know, Richard Gere, um, you know, po popularization right. of Buddhism. I think it's it's amazing to go back and look and see the history and and how it's gotten to where it is now. And I'm I'm curious to know what you think about about Buddhism in American culture today. Do you think? Do well, you I mean, we founded the school, the Naropa University, which has you know an extraordinary uh, Buddhist component and a comparative religion department. And the languages that are taught there are Sanskrit and Tibetan. We have many Tibetan teachers coming through and teachers of other Buddhist traditions. Theravadan, uh, Hinduism is studied. And, um, and there's also a World Wisdom Chair, which has been held by uh, uh, a rabbi, Rabbi Schechter. We've had uh, Native American teachers, Zen teachers. So I think that, that you know, to, to be involved with the founding of this kind of school, which has Buddhism as its backdrop, and then has this Jack Kerouac school. I mean, it makes me wonder how, how did this all, you know, this is a very interesting conjunction, and that something became, you know, this 100-year project at least, with all the, and it wasn't so early. I mean, Alan had been in India in the six, you know, early 60s. I got to India in 70. Two or three, two, three, I think. So it sounds like so, we don't need to worry about Richard Gere too much. No, no, no. I mean, he—it's fine if he can help the people of Tibet, uh, you know, be have gain their autonomy and, you know, be a, a. I mean, he gets attention because he's Richard Gere, and I mean, this is a, you know, one of the problems that, perhaps, um, you know, there aren't we. Well, Alan, if the, Alan were alive, he would definitely be weighing in on the war, and you know, he would be getting uh, that kind of, uh, you know attention to, you know, what do you think, Mr. Ginsburg? And get on the talk shows, be on these nighttime, talk, you know, endless how important do you <coughs> think, talking heads. How important do you think women's issues are in no, today's, hugely in today's political? Well, back to this question of being, I mean, I, I very much am um, honored to be able to, you know, be, uh, you know, my, my connection and friendships. And I didn't know Kerouac, but, I, you know, and I continue to know Diane and, Joanne and Janine Vega and Hetty Jones and 
others and as well as the guys and have worked you know worked so closely with Alan and so many of these figures were at our school in addition to people like poets like Ted Berrigan and I mean who I, I also see as uh, you know connected in a, a certain spiritual way and resonant way with I mean certainly the, a, a, a book like the sonnets has some you know resonance with the cut up work that that Burroughs was doing and but anyway there are lots of these kinds of intersections but the Women, I think that that was the other uh, one of the ideas with the Kerouac School was to that I would as you know take really after we were co-founders and but I was basically taking over the directorship for a number of years. Alan would come and go and occasionally he would take charge and I would be able to go off and go back to New York for a while and so on. But the um, you know the the job was to include you know open it up more to open it up more to these you know younger experimental traditions to the next generations to more women I mean in every year when I'm you know designing things I'm counting the pinks and the blues you know I have to sit there counting the pinks and the blues and then looking at the diversity and looking at bringing in other traditions and cultures and doing you know a lot of emphasis on translation and also community and also activism in the world which includes cultural activism which includes something like founding a press or starting a reading series or or being a you know musician or working collaboratively with visual artists and, and so on. So um, I think the the woman I mean that's very much uh, balanced itself out. And compared to when I was first getting started in terms of the I mean even Gertrude Stein's work was not that much in print. I mean certain key books were and Yale had that series. But you know everything started to really open up. And I also felt that the women were doing in a way, I mean, I don't want to say more interesting work, but for me, more interesting at this crucial point of really playing with form, writing, you know, longer kinds of uh, text. You know, a poet like Alice Notley, uh, I think, you know, Lynn Hitchinian's book, My Life, the work of, I mean, so many, so many people, Bernadette Mayer's work, people in my, women in my generation were really opening things up in terms of the form and in terms of a kind of, uh, you know, intervention on on even say the, the the kind of narration that you even find in Kerouac I mean in a way I felt at one point more influenced by Burroughs in you know some of his ideas and thinking and I mean it was a different kind of material but um, you know playing with one great experiment he would give students was to you know go out in in the um, just in the environment and notice everything blue and then also notice <laughs> You know, notice everything blue, and you start to see blue in a new way. And and then also, every encounter you have, when you see uh, someone, just track your mind. You know, that person reminds you of uh, somebody else, your great aunt, so and so, who's living in some obscure place. And and um, you know, you pass a mailbox, and he would create these these wonderful narratives. You know, and then you ma you're mailing a letter to Singapore or where, wherever, and. You, you, then you have images of Singapore, and you don't even have to have been in Singapore. You, you know it because of uh, you know, pictures you've seen and National Geographic and so on. But just this, this kind of uh, mind travel, which he would go on about, and being able to be in places simultaneously and trying to create texts that, you know, where things are, are um, in, intense in this different way, you know, less narrative way, and jump cuts as in film and so on. So I felt that, you know, some of the women writers I knew were picking up on some of these, I, you know, ideas or some of Cage's ideas, even you know, indeterminacy and there's is no closure. You don't, you aren't just writing a official verse culture poem with on the left hand, you know, margin that is is you can neatly tie up and say this is a poem about. So, so that the that the writing is itself this kind of you know very interesting process or you know experiments with uh, one of when I was running the St. Mark's Project, Bernadette Mayer was doing a workshop where we would just we'd get together all weekend and just write together for you know 24 hours. One of our guests asked um, <clears throat> that one of the terms you've used to talk about your your work is is, is or about yourself is as an outrider, sort of. Um, and she was wondering who some of your precedents, who who are some of the writers um, of previous generations of the avant-garde who you see as the most important influences on your work. Well, I think the, the the sense of the influence of you know what a community can be and what and the mutual support and the gift culture and 
being in touch in these interesting ways and kind you know correspondences and and uh, being involved with other people's work and help and, and also editing and promoting their you know and, and presenting it certainly the immediate generation in front of me the the, the so-called uh, new American poetry and that was my you know when I went out to Berkeley at age 20 that's what I saw I saw you know Charles Olson and Ed Dorn and Allen Ginsberg and all these various people, you know, ha and Berrigan was out there and Ed Sanders. Where were the women? That was my biggest question. But um, Lenore Kandel was reading um, an early beat woman poet from her love book. Do you know that text? Yeah, I think I yet? came. I think I'm remembering seeing it <laughs> as I was going but, through um, thousands of items. But in in any case, so that. But I think you know, in, in this way of, of community and thinking about what was possible and and that when we were starting Naropa, I kept thinking about Berkeley, you know, the way that energy that you had and that things would continue beyond the classroom. Or Black Mountain was another good example. And that and Black Mountain of course had visual artists and dancers and um, architects and and um, and it was, you know, in a strange place, just as Boulder seemed like a strange place, you know, to go to go to North Carolina and um, any case, so, but the, I mean, Stein, of course, just in her experience, you know, who's influenced a lot of the uh, women of my generation, just the, you could write some, you know, sort of endless uh, text, again, that's indeterminate, that's not, that's not so involved with the uh, semantics and that words are car carrying their, as, you know, what we consider their essential meanings, but are carried through sound and, and juxtaposition that sort of thing. Um, I would say, uh, you know, I've been working on this epic for many years, almost 30 years now, the Eovis Project, and, you know, looking at older epic and, play, you know, wanting to do something that was a reclamation from a more female uh, view. So, you know, reading the, rereading the Iliad, I mean, this is ages ago, but when I remember when I was, got onto the idea, it was actually a line from, um, from, uh, which text was it? maybe from the Aeneid, something all is full of Jove. And I wanted something, I wanted to do this assault on patriarchy. And the joke was all is full of Jove's sperm. And so that, you know, and that was generative. And so kind of deconstructing the generativeness of the patriarchy and so on. So that was a little trigger. And then looking at, and, you know, of course, the, the Commedia in terms of this more recent project, the um, structure of the world compared to a bubble, which moves, you know, kind of on this journey that ends up in a, a, a kind of ascent to the top of a mountain or so there there were always I mean it, it's this wonderful you know body of things to draw on it's endless um, you know I'm feeling I feel you know it's, I mean I want more time to go back to the you know classics and so on and yet um, and something like the Mahabharata and the uh, Ramayana which are texts that we used when I was overseeing the program in Indonesia this was uh, the whole uh, art culture there, and they have no word for art in Bali, is based on those texts. And yet they're very, it's a very different um, manifestation from what you would see in comparable kinds of, of performance in, say, India. So it's a sort of, again, this kind of uh, consociational, but also syncretic, which is my other favorite word. Syncretic, you know, these layers, things building on other things. Um, so I think also feeling that one could be influenced as well by, uh, you know, listening to Shubha Lakshmi, one of the great Indian singers, or uh, Um Kalsum, a great singer from India. I mean, that was part of, you know, it was this period where I just wanted to listen to uh, women singers from these other traditions and cultures. And that led to hearing a recording of Maria Sabina, the Mazatec shaman, and her all-night Veleda chant, which was a direct, uh, I mean, it was a, you know, appropriation to some extent. I try to credit her, but for fast-speaking woman, because of this, you know, the sense of the, um, the traveling, uh, empathetic female, to, you know, traveling through this, this, you know, I'm a this woman, I'm a that woman, I'm a day woman, I'm a doll woman, I'm a late afternoon woman, I'm a sun woman, I'm a high heel woman, I'm a high style woman, I'm an automobile woman, I'm a stay at home woman, I know how to work the machines, and things like that. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, but looking into these other uh, kinds of, 
of text. I mean, Maria Sabina was totally uneducated, barefoot all her life, Mazatec, incredible suffering. There's a wonderful uh, oral biography that was published more recently. Uh, there's a book that Jerome Rothenberg and Pierre Juris edited from the University of California on, it's just called Maria Sabina. I really recommend it. Her, her uh, oral biography, which others transcribed, is in there. It's an incredible story. And she's one of the great poets of you know, the 20th century, I think. Well, this is wonderful. So, I mean, you've given us an it's amazing list. I'm, I'm going to go back oh, afterwards and write but, down all the things that I want to read from, from what you've talked about tonight. Um, I want to actually, um, I'm going to stop talking. And I want to ask our audience to ask you some questions. So maybe we can get the house lights to come up so everybody can see everybody. And if anyone has any questions, we'll spend a few minutes um, um, with Anne answering your questions directly. So just raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Right there. Gregory? Gregory passed away in 2001. And it was very, very touching at the end of his life. He, was, uh, he thought his mother had died. She had disappeared when he was quite young. He had been, you, know, you probably know some of his story, in foster care and later in prison and so on. And it, there was a father in the picture who lived in the village, uh, Bleecker Street. And this is Gregory Corso. Gregory Just Corso. Is that who you? OK. Um, and so of fellow who was doing a documentary on Gregory, it still is yet to be released, um, had some idea that possibly his mother could be alive and hired a detective or you know, did some kind of something like that and was able to track her down. So there was a wonderful you know, reunification of this mother and son. So that was towards the end of his life and that was documented. That's supposed to be part of this documentary. And then his first daughter by a, a a, was an affair, a weekend uh, relationship. His first daughter, it turned out, w had become a nurse and probably, uh, and based in the Twin Cities area. And she came into his life also at the end and took care of him. And he died I at her home, but he, there was a period when he, he was in New York and she was caring for him in New York in, a par in an apartment in the West Village. So um, I was able to see him towards the end. He was incredibly sweet. Uh, when I visited him, he was watching a ball game and sketching, and um, his daughter was like a guardian at the door, you know, fending away the old friends who were coming with all kinds of, you know, drugs and drinks. And he was on, he was supposed to be on a strict, um, you know, his medicine and this and that. So he was, uh, I felt, I mean, it was so interesting watching these various folk pass on, in, you know, in the last, it's been a pretty hard, uh, decade or more at this point. Um, Alan also, you know, died very peacefully in a good, good spirit. So there's uh, some wonderful things of Gregory's in the, is the in the show. As I'm sure you know, there's plans for this documentary. There's work that still needs to be, you know, come out and be published. Uh, he's buried at the Ameri at the Protestant cemetery in Rome. It, with uh, Shelley. Shelley and Keats, actually, and uh, others. And there, when I visited, there are so many cats, you know, stray cats in Rome. And there's, there seems to be a cat for every uh, <laughs> grave. And there was a cat on Gregory's. Oh, that's so appropriate. He wrote a lot of poems wrote about, about cats, actually. wrote about cats. And there's cats in the exhibition, that beautiful illustration, illustration cats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, Stay tuned in terms of you know work and work that will be done about him. There, as you were saying, there should be a, a biography at some point. It'd be a very rich biography. Yes. Well, I've written you know because of the teaching at Naropa. There's a book called Vow to Poetry, which is um, you know, based on talks and little explore, explorations into this and that. The recent book, Outrider, includes some interviews that I did with, um, you know, Ernesto Cardinal and others. Um, I've edited books. I've edited, you know, a beat book, the beat book. I've edited, co-edited with um, 
Lisa Berman, a book called Civil Disobediences. So that requires, you know, a, a introduction, contextualization, and footnotes and that sort of thing. So that, and I, and I'm in. There's a book coming out on um, Lorene Niedeker, great poet, and I, there's an essay in there. So you know, particular um, invitations to present on particular subjects or writers leads to other things. And then I've had some failed novels. I mean, not not didn't get very far. And some plays, uh, but primarily it's and and I consider you know that I'm trying to finish up the Eovis epic, which is now 800 pages, and it's you know I don't know what it is. It's a lot of there's a lot of different kinds of writing within that text, but I'd say primarily poetry. Ish. This is a Nero for grad. Can you speak up a little so the audience can hear? It's just a short uh, six minute. Um, it's called uh, Colors in the Mechanism of Concealment. And my husband works in, makes movies. He's a writer, but also makes his own movies and shoots in primarily, I mean, he's worked in film, but shoots primarily in video. And I, you know, I felt this frustration at this, you know, in Guant Guantanamo, things were being revealed there. and. Um, I just started taking photos myself around the um, his loft, and I went out in the hallway and things that you know a frayed wire or a, a sign of something, things that just made me think of you know being trapped and being institutionalized. So I just took a lot of photos, and then he helped, and then he did some, and then he helped sort of edit and put it together. But it came out of a one a part of um, the Eovis project, which is colors in the mechanism of concealment. So this was a blue jacket, this was not a colorful rug for prayer, cold bare ground, trapped in Guantanamo in a dead zone. And I had Ed, my husband, reading part of it and my own voice, and then another, Todd McCarty, you might remember his voice. Um, so it, it, it's a kind of collage. I wouldn't call it a movie. I mean, it's, yeah, very short. It's online. I mean, it's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely, yeah. No, collaboration I think is very wonderful, and I, you know, there's there's some collaborations with that Burroughs did with other writers like Rambo, and and then recutting into Shakespeare and that sort of thing. I remember Alan resisting that, resisting collaboration, but trying it. Um, <laughs> and then collaborations with one, you know, there's been these cut up collaborations with poets writing with other poets. Skanky Possum published a collaboration I did with Tom Clark, called. Um, Zombie Dawn, and we were right. We were both insomniacs, so we, you know, composing online, basically, you know, through the night, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm working. I would say the work with Ed Bowes, my husband, has led to. I'm helping write some of his scripts, and I had a role in what, two movies ago, and uh, where he couldn't find somebody to be an, an, a mother. <laughs> so, um, but. But um, I don't think I'm going in. I mean, I'm working collaboratively with Pat Steer, a visual artist, and um, working with, uh, I did a project with Elizabeth Murray, and you know, various visual, Richard Tuttle, these kinds of projects where we go back and forth or look at each other's work. And then in collaboration, as you know, we did performances at Europa with our own texts, and then performing them, performing other people's words and other people's texts. So that, that still goes on. The Gertrude Stein players, we would rewrite, you know, we'd add on to Gertrude Stein, then take her texts, cut them up, uh, arrange them in these performances. No, that all continues. I don't know what to call it exactly because I, I feel like my end of it is still this poetry end, but, or, you know, orature. Have you heard that word? No. Orature. It's the new word. <laughs> the word of the day. Any other questions? 
Yes, over on the end there. Mm-hmm. Bill Morgan. Right, the book on Burroughs. Well, I don't, you know, I never experienced that. And certainly there's an incredible letter in this show here where Alan is in love with a woman. It's 1950. Uh, wants to, you know, so he's writing to Jack. Yeah. Yeah, he's writing to Jack, to Kerouac. And, um, and he, it was a, complicated. I mean, Robert Duncan felt that Alan wasn't really homosexual. And Ro D Duncan considered himself, you know, homosexual. And that Alan had this kind of obsession and fascination. I mean, he was always fascinated with a certain type of male, you know, youthful male, more um, a straight male, in fact. And there was a kind of, you know, I think Duncan used, you know, sort of arrested development in some way. Maybe not having buddies when he was a child, you know, friends on the on the block or whatever. But he had some very very intense relationships with women over the years. I think there was some, you know, old patterning in terms of just the basic misogyny of the, t you know, given the times he was living in, and he had the, you know, very intense situation with his own mother being in a you know, in the madhouse and dying in this extreme way and having to commit, you know, himself, having to help, help commit her. Um, so co very complicated relationship to female. So, but I, what's that? Well, he was very supportive of the work I was doing, and I, we traveled together reading. He, he encouraged this sort of performance and long line and going into to song. And, he, and we, because we were working together on the Naropa project, which really began in 74, but we, we became close in the early 70s. And there was also this, he was very curious about then finding a, a Buddhist teacher. Originally, when he was in India, seeking out more Hindu teachers, although he did meet Buddhist teachers, he was... He thought it was going to take too long, that the Buddhist practice was too, it was too long a journey, he says at one point. Um, but then he was finally coming to that. And so I was already had been somewhat involved with Buddhism. I had met an a early Buddhist teacher when I was 18. And I, would always, you know, I had that kind of more settled. So that, there was that that we had in common. And there was this, and Tr Trungpa was a teacher for both of us. And we had um, the school, you know, founding the school. And we, we saw eye to eye on so many things. I mean, I, we didn't always have to go through it, hash through, through things, argue, you know, as, as one can do when you're, you know, working together as organizationally, you know, with infrastructure. We really, and it was very immediate. So I don't, you know, I don't know why particularly that was the case. And I, but I also didn't feel threatened or, or particularly paranoid. I mean, I was, you know, and I, and I also felt uh, confident in my own work that I wasn't just a kind of, um, you know, sycophant or, or a, a serving him in that way. I mean, I felt I was serving a lot of my elders, I mean, of, of all genders. I think with William, um, again, a, de a, a complicated, very complicated, I mean, these are not, I can't really sum it up, but my experience with William, I mean, my first meeting with him when he came back to uh, New York, uh, 70, I guess, somewhere in there, sitting with him in Bill Berkson's apartment. And I had come from this performance in Central Park with John Giorno, and I was in some strange costume, like some alien. And my friend Warren Sonbert, the filmmaker, was showing films in Central Park. And we, then we went over to this party at Bill Berkson's, and Burroughs was in town. So I, I sat down next to him, and he was, taught, he was sort of in that period of the job and the view that we didn't need women, they could, you know, men could birth children out of their assholes. Remember that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was a challenge. <laughs> and, and, but our conversation was mainly about surveillance, because it somehow it came, I just got, you know, he said, where have you been? I said, well, I've just been, been in Central Park. And then the idea of, you know, were there lots of cops? Was it being monitored? You know, what was going on? there, and then that led to helping him get 
sort of settled. We were trying to, you know, through Alan and John Giorno and others, and then also inviting him to come read at St. Mark's Poetry Project. And my friend Andrea Dworkin, the rabid, you know, incredible, radical feminist, um, who I'd gone to college with, she came to St. Mark's, you know, in arms. You cannot have William Burroughs read at this church. I'm going to burn the church down. We're going to march on the church. I'm getting all my, you know, forces. I said, Andrea, please, please, this is William Burroughs. And reading at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, you know, you've got to get, cut some slack here. <laughs> and, um, and I was also attending his classes. He was doing a couple of classes up at, at CUNY. And I just found him very... Excess, I mean, I was so enchanted by the, you know, his his descriptions of his method, and the and my favorite books were the more cut up, you know, books, the, you know, less so, Naked Lunch, which had been worked on. I mean, the, the editing in that case was, you know, very collaborative, at the Beat Hotel, in France, when people were helping him get get that together. But anyway, I and I also loved his sense of. Um, Oh, but anyway, there was one night in Boulder where he said to me, do you realize you're the last woman in the room and maybe the last woman in the universe? And he was coming at me with, you know, to strangle me. And he'd been singing <laughs> Old Lang Syne and, you know, course earlier. Those were, those were the days. I mean, we can't quite... <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I, you know, we could have a meter of misogyny. One to, in my experience, and I, you know, and I saw Alan around Joanne and and Diane De Prima, and you know, there was a lot of history with these people. I mean, Joanne had traveled with him in India and see, seen him at his worst in some ways. Um, and he, but he, there was some he he was the 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 ethos. There was this guy ethos, male ethos thing. And I mean, but at least they weren't just signing up to go kill people, you know these guys. You know, it's this great, incredible camaraderie. But I think this will be explored. I'm sure the sexuality is so complicated. Let's take so one, more, one more question from the audience. Yeah. I was wondering if you could say that folklore is important, like stories, like you see come up again and again from the abyss, these experiences. Yeah, there are. I mean, we certainly have a lot of legends that you know, at Naro just by being at Naropa all those years, you know, watching Norman Mailer in a hot tub. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you know, at the end of some, you know, class or whatever, or, you know, just, just those kinds of things. Um, and then there, there are these, also these incredible moments, you know, literary moments when, you know, some reading of a, you know, a first reading of a poem, when you first hear something, or, um, you know, Gregory Corso, uh, attacking Robert Lowell at St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, and Kenneth Koch being uh, ritually um, shot with a blank gun during the whole Columbia period when students had taken over the university, and he was seen as some kind of enemy because he taught there. And, you know, there, there are little anecdotes like that. And then I think, but to, to I really recommend going to the work itself and, and also the, the correspondences. I mean, Kerouac's letters are, are amazing, telling, his, you know, t telling what he's excited about, what he's reading, what, what you should be reading, Alan, or you know, just that, that kind of that the, the whispered oral tradition, if you will, you know, passing on, uh, or William Burroughs talking about Count Korzybski, who you know, sort of deconstructs uh, language in a way. It's really you know, studies in semantics, and that the Count, the Korzybski book, uh, really influenced Ted Berrigan, you know, so, and, and I remember, you know, there'd be this, check out De Chirico's Hebdomerous, which was a great influence on John Ashbery at some point, this kind of thing, you know, that's passed on amongst the community, you know, the, the, the lineage, so to speak, certain texts, certain uh, books, certain moments, the, you know, wanting to know just the his the, the backstory of the Gallery 6 reading, which you cover at some point. So it's all there to be, and I feel like we're all part of it. We're all, I mean, you're all consociational with it. And the, the influence of this literary generation and beyond has, I, I mean, it's just gone everywhere. And it's still there. It's not been commodified. Yes, you can have the Jack Kerouac bomber jacket from 
ga the Gap store that, you know, the very jacket that Jack Kerouac wore for, you know, $700, or the he wore khaki, what was the ads? You know, so-and-so wore khakis, Marilyn Monroe wore khakis. And when Allen did that ad, Allen Ginsberg wore khakis, did you see that? I mean, people were in uproar. How can Allen Ginsberg sell out to this? And I said, well, Allen Ginsberg, Big Ginsberg did wear khakis, and also <laughs> that money is coming to Naropa to, we had all this mud in our, outside our office, you could not get across the lawn at one point, so that money from the Gap ad that Alan did, and Alan is sitting in front of his Buddhist shrine with, you know, there's this Buddhist thing in the back, so he's getting in a little bit of teaching and transmission. That money went for these uh, paving stones at the Kerouac School, and he insisted that there be a mention on the, you know, side of the ad, you know, money went to the Kerouac School, and I think it helped with some uh, scholarship as well. So I'm just saying the, just to pick up, you know, just sort of riffing on what you said, but that the, you know, all this is part of your history as well, I think, you know, in these, these stories. You can make them your own. You can extrapolate and add on to them. Well, I think that's a wonderful way for us to end, and I'd like to, um, to use the words of, of one of our visitors to the gallery who wrote to you a note oh. in the notebook and that says... Um, Thank you from the bottom of my tattooed heart for taking my mind, body, and soul on a hell-bent ride to the great bop apocalypse. So let's all thank Ann Waldman.